This is the 20th season of Bass Talk Live. BTL is presented by Bass Cat Boats, Strike King Lures, Aftco, Pro Guide Batteries, Spro, Gamakatsu, The Bass Tank, Denali Rods, Beatdown Outdoors, and Sunline. BTL, coming at you. Good morning, and welcome to another exciting edition of BTL Bass Talk Live, where we are going to talk about bass fishing. We got a good show for today. It's probably about like eight months past due since we talked about this, but like in the meantime, we started like another podcast, bought a couple smoking jackets, so he's like always on air, and then Jacob Wheeler went back to back and won his basically his seventh bass pro tour event last month at uh or yeah last month at in south carolina and then he smoked everybody in tennessee so that's number seven and eight and then i started looking at the stats it was like uh i don't think anyone's ever done that so i said hey no one's ever done this and then i said i might want to fact check myself after the show and if you're fact checking yourself after a show which you should do before there's only one man to go to and that is the one and only uh host of the big bass co-host of the big bass podcast and bass after dark uh ken duke and i was wrong and and you right off the top of your head were like ah oh, not 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 so fast there is someone else who has had a better streak what's up ken how are you doing man good morning matt and thanks for having me on btl i always enjoy it it, it has been a while. Like I said, said I think since the last time we've had you on, uh, you had the Big Bass podcast rolling, but uh, probably more new to the uh, fishing talk show and podcast stratosphere is Bass After Dark, which has created a nice niche for itself every Thursday evening live with Brian the Carpenter at 8 p.m. Eastern time. 8, 8 Central, 9 Eastern. Dang it. Okay. Not, no, and, and, and of course, Matt Pangrak has been on the show already. We've got to have Matt Pangrak on. Um, yeah, we're having a lot of fun with it. It's a live show. It's a talk show. Um, what kind of makes our talk show different, I think, is that instead of having one guest with a lot of questions and trying to dig deep on that one guest, we got three guests and one question. But I like it because sometimes it flows seamlessly and is amazing. And other times it is a complete <laughs> and total dumpster fire. And then you take questions where you're not sure which way it's going to go. Like, I'm assuming that you and Brian have have uh, deep discussions late into the night on what topic uh, should or should not be covered on Bass After Dark. But like I said, you never know what you're going to get. You could get a screaming Mark Jeffries. You could get a mano a mano between <laughs> uh, Ben Milliken and Randy Blockett. You could get, you know, there's all sorts of different directions it could go. You're absolutely right. You are correct, sir. Uh, yeah, we, we have that one question. And when we reach out to find our guests, we don't let the guests know who the other guests are going to be. Right. Uh, it's not that we're trying to ambush people. It's that we want a, a, an open and spirited conversation. We want all the guests to be prepared to, to state their position and be ready to defend it if necessary. And that's, that's kind of, we're, we're trying to carve that out as a niche. And, and, you know, we don't publicize who our guests will be because we're really trying to get the audience to trust us that the people we're bringing on the show are are the experts are the people they need to hear from even if they've never heard of those guests i do need a bass after dark hat we were talking about this right before uh we went live you had the i also need a big bass podcast hat as well right now there is no big bass podcast cap but i will absolutely get you a bass after dark cap and okay. uh, that'll that'll be heading your way real soon Okay, uh, like I said, I've got, I always show it off. I mean, I've showed it off a bunch. The Rick Klein. Yeah, the RC cap. That's fantastic. I got uh, the Matt Becker. Absolutely. And then tomor tomorrow's guest, fresh back from the Masters, the Ocean Pony cap with Daryl Gleason. So I was like, dude, there's so many guys that have their own caps. Like, I need to start collecting those things. 
Yeah, the whole merch thing is, is crazy. And uh, over at Bass After Dark, we're not really ready for that. We've got a grand total of 25 caps right now. And, uh, you know, Matt Pangrak's going to get one of them. But, yeah, I love that guys have their own caps. I mean, I've got a Matt Robertson Autumn cap uh, somewhere around here. Uh, and, of course, I've got my BTL cap, which I usually wear on BTL. I'm making an exception this time. Hope you don't mind. Oh yeah, no, you gotta you gotta promote that. Are your monologues on on uh, Bass After Dark? Did you intentionally make the the letters for that B A D like bad Bass After Dark? Yeah, it was kind of a um, it was kind of a a weird coincidence because I had the idea to do this show Bass After Dark before you know the big Mark bass. Jeffrey started oh. doing uh, Mark After Dark occasionally popping up and doing things and so i thought dang yeah that I, didn't last very that was not well, very regular that's kind of sporadic but so i called mark up and i said hey man i got this thing i want to do and i want to call it bass after dark you got any problem with that and he said no no go out, go out there and and so uh uh yeah it, it's been something i wanted to do long before we ever started it we actually kicked it off in november uh, it, it, as you mentioned, it's me, Brian, the carpenter, another buddy of ours named Nathan Benson. We've got a terrific intern, Jacob Morrison, who, uh, who ironically, I think he was, I think he thought he was throwing his hat in the ring to uh, be an intern for BTL and, and sort of mistakenly reached out to me. So, uh, his mistake is our game. Uh, well, the one you just streamed is, is the new world record bass around the corner. Uh, how does tournament justice work? Does the fishing or how does the fishing industry control the narrative? Ten things you don't know about the Bassmaster Classic. Are we witnessing a use movement? All sorts of stuff. So head over to Bass After Dark. Uh, already up to to um, uh, over three thousand subscribers and rolling every week. So congratulations on that. Well, thank you, sir, and I appreciate the plug very much, Matt. Also, congratulations to another Elite Series rookie winner. And John Garrett this past week at the Harris chain took a little bit more weight than uh, people were anticipating over 20 pounds a day did the majority of his damage on uh, one of the ugliest hair jigs that I've ever seen uh, and a plug. So it's good to see a deep dive and plug get back into the winner's circle. Uh, one of the things that I thought was interesting with how Bass set up the schedule was going back to back in Florida. Not exciting. I'm sorry. I know you're from Florida, but you see it so many times, especially with the Harris chain and the St. John's river. They typically tend to mix it up, but they did it in April, which was kind yeah. of cool, which, which threw a little hitch into the giddy up. It wasn't just an all sight fishing deal. It wasn't all the same thing. You saw guys doing a bunch of different stuff. Um, I did not get a press release. I may get a press release. I will reach out today. I did not want to do it on the same day as the tournament. I have never in my life heard of, seen, and I know it caused a stir on social media. Feel free to, I believe the word is rec recuse yourself from this, Ken. But uh, we had uh, we had anglers fishing inside of a lock for the first time that I have ever seen or heard of in my life have you ever seen anything like that in all the years of you covering the sport ken in any level in any league no um <laughs> but uh but what i did was I, I because it got such a stir i decided to look at the elite rules and uh and also do some other checking as best i could and there's nothing in the elite rules saying that you can't fish inside a lock Okay. Uh, now that doesn't mean it's not prohibited on a, a local or state level. So I got to looking at the Florida state regs and there's no rule against fishing inside a lock in the state regs. But I know that a lot of lot, and there are a lot of locks in Florida mm -hmm. because these lakes are, are almost exclusively natural, but a hundred years ago, and that's, it's not, an exaggeration, 100, 100 plus years ago, a lot of canals were dug connecting these lakes together for property development and stuff like that. And uh, when these locks were, were put in, most of them have a no fishing sign. And uh, not say all of them do, but a lot of them do. Fishing in the canals is very common. And anybody who fishes Florida has, has made it a habit to fish the mouths of these canals. Because if you've got current blowing in or current coming out you're going to have a shell bed there and there's going to be some bass there but fishing inside a lock no that's 
that was interesting to me. So I reached out, or actually, a uh, local who lives on the chain uh, reached out and said that there at one point had been a no fishing sign on that lock, according to him, that appeared to no longer be there when he was watching the, the coverage. So based on what your research has said, and Bass, I give credit for, has always been a proponent of it is if it is public navigable waterway, they are not going to restrict where you fish. I can think of a marina outside of the Chickahominy on the James. It has a big no fishing sign. When we fish there in the open, it is made clear that that is navigable and fishable water and that is the marina or the local residents that have put up the no fishing sign it has been cleared with the wildlife conservation to where legally we can go into that marina and fish even though it says no fishing it kind of one of those deals so i could understand right. if there is no law or rule against it and it does not say no fishing in that then it would be fishable water and then it is up to the angler to clear that with the tournament director, if there is any question of whether or not they can do it. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. Um, I'm, I'm very curious about how all this shakes out. Obviously, it's it's a big stir right now. Uh, but if it's not posted and if uh, if it's been cleared with the tournament director, then you know you can't legitimately have much of a gripe with that. Now, if it's been cleared with the tournament director, but the tournament director did not communicate this somehow to the entire field i think that's potentially an issue that's what i'm saying should the tournament director have and i do not know so it's either going to be chris or lisa those are the two people one of those two or maybe in coordination would make that decision uh i'm not even going to go into the hypothesize on how but obviously if it was on bass live and nothing has happened here the reason i say this is there are a number of veteran anglers bernie schultz being one of them who was like basically yeah. it was a what the hell with a picture of, <laughs> with a picture of, and you could tell he's in the lock because there's a water line right so that right. means that the, the the lock is either raising or lowering uh and that's what he said. Cody on here said Trey had said he had called the lock master and talked to her about or talked about fishing it as well as Lisa. So here's my question. Should that have been a did does Bass have an obligation then to send a text or, or email out to the rest of the field that says, hey, the lock is in play? Does Bass have an, an actual obligation to do that? I don't know. I think it would be a good policy to do that. I think that uh, I think that's a, an interesting line because uh, there are a know. number I, of locks. I don't know. It's yeah, weird. there are a number of locks out there, and if you're going to allow that fishing in one, I would think you'd want a rule that encompasses all the locks accessible from that body of water. Uh, and I would think that in that circumstance, you would want to communicate that to the full field. I would think that uh, you'd always want to err on the side of additional communication. Uh, so, because, you know, because you not only want to avoid unfair practices, you want to avoid the appearance of impropriety because we, we both know that, that there's enough concern about impropriety out there and you have to fight it at every turn because ours is a sport that's fought on such a large surface area and, and usually without a lot of oversight. That's fair. I, I don't know what the uh, right answer is. Like I said, I will shoot uh, Chris a text today as a guy who's in the media who does it. I don't care either way. I just wonder what the stance is there to clear up all the confusion. Uh, you're obviously not going to make everybody happy regardless of no, what it is. Right. But it was like a it was a weird deal just looking at that and being like, pretty sure he's throwing a top water in the lock yeah right up against the gate <laughs> yeah which i mean makes sense i've always heard it in florida it goes way back to i spent a day on uh okeechobee uh just kind of documenting a practice day for terry scroggins and he did a lot of throwing around the outside of the locks uh 
mainly because in Florida, it's the only place that, and you're from Florida, that fish bait fish can get pinned up against something hard where they can get ambushed. Otherwise, the marshes and things, it just goes, 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 goes. That's a great point. You're exactly right about that. There's not a lot of hard cover um, that will allow you to, to pin bait fish. We don't have a lot of seawalls particularly. Uh, usually it's even hard to spot exactly where the bank is. There's so much grass and reeds and stuff like that out there, but, uh, you've got something unique. A lot of these canals have riprap on the sides. A lot of these canal, all, all these canals and, that have, uh, locks have mm -hmm. that hard gate. Uh, yeah, I, I don't want to be thrown there. Uh, some of these riprap walls are the only place you can legitimately, throw a, a conventional square bill and get it to bounce around like that. And can you catch them there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You don't often catch a lot of big fish that way, but you can, you can rack up some numbers and during the right time of the year, you can catch some big fish that way. And I wonder if it also would have to have anything to do with the, uh, like it, could that be a case by case study with the lock master? Like say hypothetically, of course, Mr. Duke, hypothetically, another angler, had asked an, uh, another lock master at another lock at a different canal. Hey, I just saw a large one blow up on some shad. Uh, can I make a cast? And that lock master had hypothetically said, absolutely not. You're in a lock. And he said, oh, I know. I just wanted to make sure. That to me is the biggest problem or potential problem here. Because the way that, and I don't have the elite rules in front of me right now, but the way the elite rules lay out is, you can't fish in an area where other anglers would be prohibited from fishing. So let's imagine that a guy pulls into a lock and, and there's no sign and there's no pre-tournament admonition against fishing in a lock. And there's, and the lock master even says, yeah, sure, go ahead and fish. But then the second guy comes in and tries to move in and do the same thing. And a third guy, and eventually that lock master is going to say, whoa, whoa, that's enough. Just you two. Well, now suddenly you've basically made an unfair advantage for the first guy or the first two guys who got in there. And, and now you have a serious problem. And that's what I worry about here. But also the point you make where one lock is fair game, another lock is not fair game, despite the fact that there's no signage on either of them. You're just dealing with a, a lock master who's deciding on the basis of what mood he is in that day or how much cash he may have been slipped. To decide who can fish or not fish and that's an untenable position now listen i am not in any way shape or form throwing shade on trey mckinney had not at all not at all been in this lock doing the exact same thing with a rico pop we have been talking about the exact same thing nor am i throwing shade on Bassmaster because no. it, it obviously i mean the the clip that i just showed was highlighted on Bassmaster as yeah. Trey McKinney starts his morning throwing a topwater. So it's not like there's an oversight where they were like, wait, he was doing what? Like it's, it's clearly been vetted, but I mean, dude, you well, watched a lot of, eh, okay. Well, let's back up here. When you say clearly vetted, well, uh, why would they put that out there if it was because, because there's little communication between the tournament department and the media departments. Very little communication. Okay. Um, they both have jobs to do. They both do their jobs well. But I don't think they always know what each other is doing. And I think that that presents some challenges. Um, this is a topic we covered on a recent episode of Bass After Dark called uh, What Does Tournament Justice Look Like? We were talking about the, the appeal process when an angler has been perhaps disqualified or something like that. And and, and one of the points that got raised in that show, we didn't want to talk specifics, but Brian the Carpenter brought up uh, an incident from the 2013 Classic where Mike Iaconelli um, got agitated about something and started yelling at a dog. Well, <laughs> Mike got fined $10,000 for yelling at a dog. Um, and Bass, after he yells at a dog and they fine him $10,000, the Bass media department, the guys who were doing the television and web coverage ran that clip over and over and over again. I'm it sure you remember because it was, yeah, because it was salacious. Now, is that really 
cool that the league is fining him for that behavior, but also making hay out of it. That's different than if CBS or some major television network is out there covering it versus when the league is covering it. It would so, be like the NBA on NBA.com running every angle from the malice at the palace. Exactly. Exactly. Not it's CBS not or ABC best. or NBC or whatever. It would be the league that is profiting from it that is also fining Ron Artest. Yeah. I see that's the difference. That's the difference to me. Now it, it and 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 while I'd like there to be a cleaner line, each of these departments has a job to do. And each of these departments by and large does a good job. Mm -hmm. Um and I don't I don't envy the challenges they face because I was part of that for many years when I was yeah. at Bass, I was out there trying to get the best story I could um, irrespective of, of what, you know, the guy running the boat yard might want me doing. Um, and, and it's a fine line sometimes. So I, I could not disagree more, Tyler. It has absolutely nothing to do with the fact that it was Trey. It just happened to be Trey. Uh, I also think that there's about, and this is my personal opinion, I feel like there's maybe three guys in the field that it would even cross their mind to throw into, to, to fish inside of a lock, and the kid is 19, he hasn't been around, and he's thinking outside of the box, so he happened to be one of the three that would even cross their mind that that is an available option, but it's also the same reason why the dude's probably it's the same reason why the dude's leading angler of the year. I mean, he's done other outside the box things. You watch him catch the six and a half pounder on a massive glide and then start screaming. They're floaters. They're floaters. I was like, dude, like Hackney ain't going to go trolling around the middle of Harris throwing a nine inch glide looking for floaters in April. Like there's just certain things that you're going to do when you're younger. And that was one of them. That's a classic example of, 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 not being crammed into the mold of professional fishermen that the other rest of the guys in the field have fair point. Ken, I think it's a very fair point. You know, it reminds me of, um, it reminds me of one of the big challenges that these anglers have, especially the guys who've been around for a while. Um, they have an idea of what the rules are and they, they probably look at the rules pretty carefully before each season starts, but it's hard to notice what has changed. It's hard to notice what might've been left out, what might've been added in, unless it's a big deal. Mm -hmm. and, and the best example I can think of for that is 2006. Uh, at Santee Cooper, three anglers were DQ'd from the Santee Cooper Elite Tournament because they let someone else run their outboard while they stood on the front deck looking for spawners. Now, two years earlier, that would have been fine. But sometime in 2005, BASS made it a rule that you can't do that. And so three anglers got DQ'd from that tournament. Kevin Van Dam, Alton Jones, and Randy Howell. Um, and it was because they, they didn't realize suddenly there's the new rule in there. The longer you've been in the league, the more the more you tend to rely on, on your own memory and what you thought was the rule and stuff like that rather than maybe getting out there and, and really doing a, a hardcore analysis. If, if it was ever against the rules to fish in a lock, I, I'd love to be able to go back and look through all the iterations of the rules through the years and see if that was ever in print. That's fair. Uh, I do want to pull up this screenshot real quick because there are just a couple things that I'm impressed with. One, uh, I'll circle this. You rarely see a red headed top water, <laughs> something that I feel like in the seventies, eighties, and even nineties was a staple of top water baits. They go back way before that. I mean, that, that was a staple in the thirties, the forties, the fifties. I think they started falling out of favor, uh, beginning probably in the seventies, but, uh, yeah, the old redhead bait was the go-to for decades. And yet for somebody under the age of say 80, to have one is pretty unusual. Also, uh, eight bait casting reels visible on Trey McKinney's front deck and not a single spinning rod. <laughs> uh, the other thing that 
is old school that I appreciated was the can of uh combo bang, bang located yeah. right here for a 19 year old to break out the can of bang is a baller move. Now I know that's big in Illinois where Trey is from. Like everybody has the, like every time I smell it, it's like super nostalgic for me, <laughs> but I, I was highly impressed with the bang. And then the other thing is you can tell that he's in the lock. Correct me if I'm wrong here, because that's the water line that the lock goes up to and then drops down to, and then drops up to. And then also you could see the water pouring into the sides when he made his original cast. Yeah. Yeah, that's the water line right there. Trey McKinney. So so do you think it's right for the guys to be pissed off about this, Ken? Or sh or is this a take your medicine, move on? Or what? where is the, is there a conclusion to this? Or are we just spinning our wheels here? I'd like to learn more from the uh, water authority there um, and see what the their regulations might be about fishing in the lock uh i'm gonna contact the lake county water authority and see if they have any rules about it um or if it depends on signage you know but i'll say this i didn't find it in the elite rules yeah i i if there's no sign um then i think everybody needs to take their medicine and move on um if there was if there's a policy on the body of water about it, but there is no sign and, and the lock master had no issue, then I, I think you got to take your medicine. If Trey McKinney cleared this with a tournament director or manager and, and they had a one-on-one -on -one conversation, I'd be curious as to why that wasn't communicated to the entire field. So I guess I got more questions than answers right now. It was a good, it's a good talking point. It's something unique. And anytime we have, you know, uh, Rick Clunge is competing in his 500th or was it 499th or 500th career turns. This is 500th yeah. coming up with bass that's, on the St. John's. That's huge. And there's a lot of tournaments. And anytime you see something unique, it's going to stand out. It's going to create a discussion point. And listen, this is the top level of tournament bass fishing, folks. There's a point where you're discussing stuff. You're talking about it. This is entertainment. This is theater. This is the top level. There is a hundred of them. This is what we're supposed to talk about. This is why they have the live. There's a difference between it's, it's entertaining. It's di discussion generating. Like, this is what you guys want. Like, we're not whining about it. We're not complaining about it. We're watching guys at the top level, the youngest to win at that top level of the elite series, do something unique. This is what bass wants. This is what the sport wants. This is what we need. This is what we're supposed to do is talk about it, analyze it, break it down, discuss it, etc. Well, I'm not sure this is what BASS wants everybody talking about. I got to believe that when a, a controversy like this crops up around a tournament that uh, the tournament department kind of cringes and, and, and wishes that the, the controversy would go away, but you know, they, they have an opportunity too. today would be mm -hmm. an ideal day to put out a press release explaining the whole situation. Yeah. I, uh, Bobby said it's ridiculous that we we're even talking about it. I don't think it's ridiculous because in the thousands of tournaments that I've covered, I've and, and out of every single elite series tournament, I would venture to say that he is the first elite series angler in history to catch a fish in a lock that went to the weight. Hard to know. Hard. To, we've had, We've had other incidents in Florida locks that were also highly newsworthy. That didn't involve catch of fish, though. <laughs> no. That did not involve catching fish. All right. Uh, holy cow, we're a half hour, and I wasn't even planning on talking about that, but I'm glad we did. Let's take a break. When we come back, we'll talk about the greatest anglers in the world. You good on that? I'm good on that. This show's way overdue, Ken. And like I said, Wheeler's on a tear. I thought the likes of which we have never seen, quite frankly, he's barely just halfway there to the likes of which we have seen before, which you pointed out. Yeah. Halfway. He's got eight top tens in a row. He's, he's just scratching the surface of the greatness that has taken place in past years at professional fishing, which shocked me. It's true, yeah. Uh... Got to have some respect for history and what some others have done before. Because I checked like KVD. Oh. 
uh, and ski like guys, guys, you know, just just guys that are known by their first yeah. names and initials. And then you said, ah, did you check? Aaron. Did you check? And I said, no. But then I started thinking, I said, I should. And I went back. Oh, my gosh. We're going to get into that when we come back. It's BTL on a Tuesday, April 16th. We'll be back right after this. The new Puma STS has been redesigned from the ground up. With the angler, design, function, and performance in mind, nothing on this new offering was compromised, and the only thing carried over from the previous version is the name. Based on the soft touch series hull that started with the flagship Jaguar, this new model is nimble and performs incredibly well at all speeds with either a 250 or 300 horsepower engine. Featuring a new 96 inch wide body footprint, this hull measures out at 20 foot 7 inches in length. Industry-leading design coupled with tournament-winning performance. The Puma STS from Basscat. Feel the rush. Gamakatsu, the innovation leader in fish hooks, is launching Nano Alpha technology in 2024. Nano Alpha is a new finish available on Gamakatsu's most popular hook styles. It delivers two times slicker performance, four times better corrosion resistance. Nano Alpha technology makes the world's greatest fish hooks even better in 2024 to help anglers catch more fish. Born in Japan, using technology, innovation, and precision, Sunline produces the widest selection of fishing lines at the most technologically advanced line factory in the world. Manufactured at the strictest tolerances to produce victories at the highest levels of tournament bass fishing. From household names like Christie, Swindle, and Cruz, to young guns like Cook, Logan, New, and Welcher, they all trust Sunline to take them to the top of the leaderboard. Choose the line that will give you the strength to guarantee your confidence. Sunline. Hi, welcome back, BTL, on a Tuesday with Ken Duke. I haven't had Ken on in like five or six months. That's what I just said. It's because he's, you know, he's busy doing other podcasts every single day of the week now. Seems Fast like it. After Dark and the Big Bass podcast with Terry Battisti. All right. How did this start? I was trying to recall, like, you remember this uh. way better because I called you fired up one day and you're like oh i'll i'll get right on that that's a great question and something that i've been working towards for decades as well and i think i might have a solution or something along those lines right yeah exactly well what happened was one morning apparently tim horton put out a tweet or something i'm not oh yeah this pissed me this fired me up i remember this (laughs) now it's all coming back to me So Tim puts out a tweet or some social media post saying that we are witnessing the uh, greatest tournament bass angler in history, something like that. Um, And and he was talking about Jacob Wheeler. And uh, I I think, Matt, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth here. You're thinking, well, how, how in the world can he ignore what Kevin Van Dam has accomplished over the last 30 plus years Mm -hmm. and, and suddenly anoint, Jacob Wheeler, who's a very young man, still in the prime of his career, obviously, but but without all the accolades that KVD. I'm trying to find this post here, so just keep going. Uh, And anyway, so you called me that morning, and you were all fired up. It was uh, it was shades of uh, Mark Jeffries at that moment because I usually, when I get a call from uh, somebody at 
associated with BTL who's all worked up about something. It's Mark. Uh, but this time it was you. <laughs> and, and I think you just first, you asked me, well, who's the greatest competitive bass angler of all time? And I said, well, obviously it's Kevin Van Dam. I mean, that's pretty clear to me. He said, where would you rank Wheeler? And I said, well, Wheeler's still an up and comer. I said, I, I don't think I, I rank Wheeler in the top five or 10 yet. <laughs> um, but you know, so that, that started the discussion. And I, and then I explained, I I'm working toward coming up with some sort of way to, uh, assess these guys quantitatively and, and qualitatively as best I can. And I said, I want to do it as objectively as I reasonably can. And so, um, I was already kind of working at it, but it kind of fallen into a back burner and, and I, I got involved in it after we talked because, you know, you mm -hmm. said I'd be coming on real soon and, uh, that turned into, you know, like two years later, but no, <laughs> I'm kidding. But, uh, so I, I've created this, this massive spreadsheet where I'm factoring in things like how many times did a guy make a classic or a red crest or a forest wood cup? How many times did he finish, you know, top 10, how many, uh, wins does he have in those championships? How many wins does he have in regular season tournaments? How do I weight those wins? How do I weight angler of the year titles mm -hmm. and things like that? And so that got me all fired up to try to evaluate. I found it. Timmy just posted top 15 of all time. Who you got? Here's mine. Number one, Jacob Wheeler. That's and here's his reasoning. Wins practically every round he fishes in MLF and still not 35. Won the first two elite events he ever fished. No one has ever done it at a higher level. Just factual statements right there from Tim. And then number two, KVD. Most influential angler in history of the sport. Resume is unequaled at this point. That's what fired me up on it. Uh, and then his rest of his was ridiculous as well. It, all anglers that deserve to be in there, just the order of which. So then he's got Mark Davis, Aaron Martins, Rick Clun, Edwin, Roland Martin, Skeet Reese, Denny Brower, Jordan Lee, rounding out the top 10. And then his next five were Nixon, Hackney, Dance, Davey Height, and then Ott the Foe. Um, so anyway, that's what started this whole thing off. So thank you. Thank you, Timmy. Yeah, that that's great stuff. and and we all have an opinion on such things and, and opinions are, are kind of a, a person by person challenge. You know, we can't get everybody in a room and, and fight it out over an opinion. And, which is beautiful. And, which is beautiful uh, and frightening and daunting and an exercise in futility and stupidity sometimes. <laughs> but, but what we can do or, or what I thought I wanted to try to do was to quantitatively do this. And, and I started, I started by saying, well, if we're talking about the goat, uh, what I, what I, what I worked on here was a system for evaluating the goat, the greatest of all time. My system is not designed to rank the 500 greatest competitive anglers in bass fishing history. It's not that nuanced. Uh, if I, if you don't mind, Matt, I'll just, explain who even gets on the list to be evaluated to be on the list to be evaluated you have to have won a classic a wood cup a red crest or you have to have won a bass flw or major league fishing angler of the year title or you have to have qualified for 10 or more of those championships because i think everybody would agree you ain't the greatest of all time unless you've accomplished one of those things. Um, hands down, I think that's a given. Nobody is in the discussion for GOAT if you haven't done one of those things. So that still left me with 115 anglers to evaluate because 115 different guys have done one of those things. Then I started to weight these accomplishments. And, you know, I'm given points for how many classics you've been to, how many wood cups you've been to, how many red crests you've been to, I'm given points for how many tournament wins you have, how many uh, AOI top tens you have, how many uh, 
you know, U.S. Open wins you have, how many All-American wins you have, and and they're all weighted. And and s- in some cases, you know, uh, for example, um, a BASS win in the Elite Series is worth more than an FLW win during that same time period um, because I thought that was fair. But obviously, there's a lot of subjectivity in that. But that's also the to a degree, the flexibility of my system, because it's very easy for me to change the valuations. If, if somebody disagrees with me um, that winning AOI on the BASS side is worth more than winning AOI on the FLW side, all I have to do is change some values and I can turn it around. But the one inevitable thing, I believe, is that Kevin Van Dam is the the greatest competitive bass angler in history because he has accumulated more of these obvious career goals than anyone by far. Keep going. Well, I mean, I I dig into uh, some of the stuff. What What I came up with was my score. And, and my point system, you know, I can tell you that Kevin Van Dam racked up 27,960 points, but that doesn't mean anything unless you know how each point system is broken down. I'm not going to go into that. That's way too tedious. But what I did was in, in, in ranking all these, these accomplishments, um, he had the highest score of anybody. And so I divided everybody's score by Kevin's score so that, of course, he scores a perfect 100% because he's number one and I score him at 100% right now. Uh, The second greatest angler of all time under this effort to be objective in the system. And and read what you're ranking him on one more time, just so we can be clear. Oh, okay. So it's, 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 it's the, there is subject, there is subjectivity in trying to achieve objectiveness. Yes. Here are the objective standards I'm looking at. Okay. How many classic appearances do you have? How many classic wins do you have? How many wood cup appearances? How many wood cup wins? How many red crest appearances? How many red crest wins? How many, um, uh, bass AOI top tens, FLW top tens, BPT top tens. How many AOI wins in each of those categories? How many, um, how many BASS wins, not counting the classics? How many FLW wins, not counting the classics? How many MLF wins, not counting mm-hmm. the, the Red Crest? Uh, how many U.S. Open wins? How many All-American wins? Uh, and then it's that's the object. significant achievement milestone. And that you okay. So that's what you so. have. So 15 to 20 of these categories. Exactly. And the reason I didn't do top 10s and, and, and top 5s. You like can't. That, is because, well, A, that would be remarkably tedious, and B, I'm not looking to, to rank the 500. I'm looking to rank the very peak guys. Yes. I'm trying to come up with the very best system to rank, say, the top 25, 30 guys. And you said out of all the thousands of people that have cast a line professionally, you whittled it down. I'm still thinking that's a shockingly large number that qualifies for all this. A hut, you said what 125 anglers, 115 anglers had accomplished one of those things we talked about, like been to at least 10 major yep. championships, won a major AOY, won a major mm-hmm. classic Red Crest Wood Cup. Yeah, 115 guys have accomplished that. Now, I'll tell you who ranks 115th on this chart is, is Kevin Hawk. Because Kevin Hawk really only made it to, uh, you know, one Forest Wood Cup. He won it. He does not have a lot of other major career accomplishments. So he scores very low on this table. Um, and you wouldn't think necessarily if Kevin Hawk is a guy you'd want to evaluate when you're looking only at the goats. Kevin Hawk's a wonderful, mm-hmm. super talented angler. But but he ranks he ranks last in this list of guys to accomplish those things. I don't think he fishes professionally. I know he was guiding for a while in Gunnersville. I don't know what Kevin. I think he now. bounced. I think he's done. Ah, he's well, that's a shame. He's a great living a high day. quality life and actually enjoying life at this point. Spending <laughs> quality time with those around him. 
It's amazing. <laughs> Good for <laughs> him. I'm, I'm a Kevin Hawk fan. But see, I tried to rank everybody who had those accomplishments. Now, so that's it. Now, where the subjectivity comes from is how do you weight those different accomplishments? Right. And for example, I, I said a Bassmaster Classic appearance is worth 100 points. A Bassmaster Classic win is worth 1,000 points. A Wood Cup appearance, and I said a Red Crest is the same. A Red Crest appearance, 100 points. A Red Crest win, 1,000 points, because I, I consider them to be parallels. A Wood Cup appearance. In, in accomplishments, said, in difficulty yeah. of accomplishments. Exactly, exactly. Now, I did not think that a Wood Cup appearance or a Wood Cup win was as valuable as a classic appearance or a classic win. I think it is 80% as valuable or 80% of the accomplishment. If you disagree. And that's I the can't. beauty. If you have some dude who disagrees, you can be, well, I'll just plug in those values to your values are interchangeable, which is a beautiful thing. Exactly. I can, if this is you. And literally you have no peer when it comes to arguing statistics. Well, you know, I, I don't know about that. Um, I, I have this, reputation which sometimes makes me scratch my bald head of, of being the stat guy and and maybe it's well earned i think but I, I want everybody to know i got into the stats aspect of our sport because nobody else was telling that story instead what we had was all these people talking about the sport and and they had a voice in the sport but they were speculating oh he's he's really oh he's this is the biggest comeback ever but they didn't know what they were talking about they didn't have a full appreciation of stuff. And so I decided that I wanted to be the guy who helped to quantify that. And, and so I have this reputation as being the stats guy. And, and it reminds me of a, a, a quote I really love about math and stats. Uh, this mathematician of the 20th century he said, math is not about numbers, equations, computations, or algorithms. It's about understanding. And I think that really encapsulates it for me. Math helps me understand. And math also helps me support the statements that I try to make about our sport and about the, the guys who participate in it. Um, and I, when somebody else comes at me and says, well, how can you say Kevin Van Dam is the, the greatest when we all know it's Roland Martin or Jacob Wheeler or Rick Klun? Uh, it's, it's nice to be able to say, well, it's because Kevin did this more often and that more often and this at a higher level. Uh, because without that, I think a lot of comments and arguments just are very hollow. All right. Can we start at 10? Let's start at 10. And some of these I think are going to, are going to shock people. Let's start at 11. Or actually start at anyone else on the list who might surprise you between like between 11 and 115. <laughs> okay. Let's start at uh, 20. Jacob Wheeler. Wow. Number 20. Number 20. And, and, and here's what it boils down to is uh, Jacob Wheeler doesn't have a lot of classic or red crest wins. That's what's holding him back. And that's, that's actually, uh, and, it, and it brings me back to another topic here because um, when, when ESPN did the greatest angler debate in 2005, uh, Rick Clun won and Roland Martin finished second. And what that told me at the time was that the audience values the Bassmaster Classic more than they value Angler of the Year. Not that I do, or you do, Matt, but the average angler and, and fan of the sport values the classic dramatically more than they value AOI. Now, I do not. I gave the classic win a thousand points on my system. I gave... Bassmaster AOI 1500 points because I think it's the greater accomplishment. 
Now, do I think that Roland Martin is the greater angler than Rick Klun? Not, not really. But I think angler of the year is a greater accomplishment. And, and so I weighted AOI heavier than I weighted the classic. And I weighted AOI higher than I rated the wood cup or higher than I rated the red crest. And, and it's a, it's a subjective valuation, but anyway, let's go back to Jacob Wheeler. He ranks 20th currently. Well, and he gets points for his BFL all American win. Yes, he does. His forest wood cup win. Yes, he does. Uh, every, uh, his, he has, a, does he have a best master open win? I think he does. Uh, I don't think he does. His, his two elite series wins. He's got his elite wins, yeah. His uh, BPT Angler of the Year wins, multiple. Yes, he does. His BPT regular season wins. His BPT top tens. His BPT uh, top tens, his FLW AOI, top yeah. tens, all that is. Okay. But he comes in, and, and here's the number that I, I think is maybe more, more meaningful in terms of uh, – of comparison for folks who are watching or listening. Jacob Wheeler has accomplished 26% of what Kevin Van Dam has accomplished. Now, Wheeler has a long road ahead of him. Let's assume conservatively that he's got another 25 years to catch Van Dam. He can certainly do it. But right now, I would maintain that Jacob Wheeler is 26% of the way to Kevin Van Dam. Does that include his two wins this year? Yes. I updated this this morning. Um, and, and you know, that's that may be shocking to some people. He's a quarter of the way there. He, he's basically a quarter of the way there. Um, but he's going to get a lot closer, obviously. Um, but he's not there yet. And, and to say he's there already, you know, if you want to argue that Jacob Wheeler is fishing at a higher level than anyone has ever fished before, I got, I got nothing. Mm -hmm. I got nothing. He, that may be absolutely dead on accurate. And I'll say this, if he's not fishing at the highest level anyone's ever fished at before, he's so close that I'm not sure we can tell the difference. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, so so Wheeler right now is at 20. Um, Skeet Reese, one of the all-time greats. He's at, at 17th place all-time. He, By my scale, he's accomplished 28% of what Van Dam has accomplished. Um, so right now, based on yours, everyone you're going to talk about from here on forward, based on your uh, objective level of accomplishment that was designed using subjective valuations evaluations but it's impossible to do so without that uh absolutely everyone is ahead of is ahead of wheeler from here well, on out. the rest of the guys we're going to talk about are, yes. are ahead of wheeler. we may throw in a few and, and this is, we're not talking about right now or currently this is in the big picture of things right now as it speaks in relation to every cast that has been made professionally since 1968. <laughs> yeah, but you know, there and there's some unknown. Minus the lost archives. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. The, minus the, the lost thing. archives from the American Bass Association mm -hmm. and and American you Bass know. and blah blah blah. Okay. Um, uh, Bill Dance ranks 15th all time. Uh, but you also got to remember, Bill Dance retired at 40. Mm -hmm. Um. Uh, Davey Height ranks a spot ahead of Bill at 14th. Uh, now we're going to get into some more guys who are active. Greg Hackney, 13th all time. By my system, he's accomplished a third of, of what Greg Hackney has accomplished. Clark Wendland is 12th all time. Uh, Edwin Evers is 11th. He's accomplished 35% uh, of what we have listed uh, on this criteria. Uh, now we're in the top 10. And what really surprised me about the top 10 under this system was it, it really matched up pretty well 
with that greatest angler debate top 10 from almost 20 years ago. Wow. Um, some guys were, were left out guys like Hank Parker who accomplished so much in a very short career. You got to remember Hank quit before he was 40. Um, and he still ranks and, and Hank Parker still ranks 21st, despite the fact that he quit before he was 40 and was coming off a classic win. Um, ninth, uh, 10th, Jay Ellis, uh, ninth, David Dudley. That's interesting. So many accomplishments in FLW. It, it drives me crazy when people want to say Andy Morgan is the goat of FLW. I don't know how drunk you have to be to believe that because, because it is so clearly Dudley. It's not, Scott, Dudley, Martin. It's not Scott Martin. How is it's it not, not Scott Andy Martin? Morgan. He has more wins and he's got angler of the years and Dudley's got four angler of the years. Scott has one. Dudley's also got a, a wood cup. Martin's got a wood cup. Dudley's got a lot of wins as well. Okay. Remember, Wait, yeah, yeah, yeah. Four angler of the years. Yeah, he went on a straight. AOI is huge. Yeah. AOI is and that's huge how Clark the... Wenlet got up there, too. I mean, he's he exactly. had what three angler of the years on FLW. You are not gonna break into the top 10 without an AOI to your credit. It's okay. what held Edwin Evers numbers down. If Edwin has an AOI to his credit, he immediately jumps up to number six. From eleven, but and Edwin has classics and red crest. Classics and red crest. Yeah, that's where Edwin is racking up his points. Um, if Edwin has one AOI, um, and he, well, he does have an AOI with 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 um, MLF the first year, but if he had one BASS AOI, um, he would have bumped up to sixth place all time. How did you deal with like the world championships and the cup? and all that like is that even included in that or are those considered specialty events that don't factor into the core they they were specialty events but i, I treated them basically the same as a, a regular season bpt okay event. i was just curious i don't we don't need to argue the semantics of that i just was curious if those yeah. made the list although those were small field tournaments by and large um on the bass side and the mm -hmm. FLW MLF side, you have to qualify for. Them. To qualify. I'm, I'm I'm good with that. That's what, so. Did yeah. you treat like the bass postseason wins from like nine, ten, eleven, twelve when they did the twelve angler field the same? Just because hey, you had to be in the top twelve to even get in the dang tournament. So only ten percent of the field even had a chance to win it. So even though you only beat eleven other guys, you really accomplished something. I treated them the same as a full field regular season win. Okay, I like it. Perfect. So we just did Dudley at what nine. Dudley's at nine at eight underrated guy, a guy who is not given as much credit for his career as he should be. In my opinion, he ranked 10th in the greatest angler debate back in 2005, Mark Davis, you know, three BASS AOIs, uh, a classic win. He, I got him as uh, eighth all time, seventh all time, Gary Klein, couple AOIs, lots of regular season wins, Really, 30 classic appearances. No, so a guy who's number seven never won a classic, never won a classic. Wow, do you know how consistent and how much you have to qualify for to be in the top seven of this list without ever having won a major championship? You have to be remarkably consistent, and that's exactly what he's done. You know, we're talking about a guy who, who could have, if he doesn't take a couple of years off from bass and, and go to fish, um, the California circuits back in the early 80s this is a guy who very easily could have qualified for 32 33 classics in a row he qualified for 17 in a row between 84 and 2000 2001 and then he missed a year as bubble boy he was the bubble boy when he missed a classic and then he st strung together 10 more in a row gary klein uh, he ranked ninth in the greatest angle debate back in 2005. Um, he, he's a legend. He's absolutely one of the greatest okay. ever. Um, number six, all time, Aaron Martins. Um, and you might think, well, Aaron never won uh, a major championship. Well, he's got the three AOIs. He's got a bunch of wins. He's got a ton of classic appearances 
and he racks up the points that way. Mm -hmm. um, and yet, even at number six all time, he is at 41% of the Van Dam accomplishments. So here we're... We're in the top five now. We're going in the top five. Number I don't five. have a drum roll sound effect. If I, had, if I had the sound effect board, if I had you know my producer, I'll get him on that. There you go. Uh, number five. Uh, would you care to guess? You want to you guess at the top five as we roll them down? Uh, Larry Nixon. Uh, no, but Larry Nixon is in the top five. Oh yeah, why don't, why don't you rattle off your top five, and we'll see. How oh, you I don't. No, no, no. I would. This isn't a debate on that. I want to know statistically. We're on a roll here. We've started from twenty going forward. I don't want to break this momentum. I want you to okay. go ahead and do the list, and then we can talk about it. Gotcha. Number five, Denny Brower. Okay. Uh, number four, Larry Nixon, and Larry Nixon is the the first guy we've talked about so far who has accomplished more than half of what Van Dam did and larry now retired larry retires at 53 percent of those accomplishments now again these are these are point systems that i've you know subjectively placed on things larry nixon is one of the all timers he's qualified for more major championships than anyone else he is how many angler of the years did denny have because he had the one classic in 98 well he had that's a he had two one with flw one with bass Okay, so he gets okay. He gets double credit there, but I did not value the FLW AOI as highly. Mm -hmm. But he also has a ton of wins, doesn't he? Have he's got yeah, he's got nineteen wins. Nineteen wins. So that's well, that's, I'm sorry, just on the bass side. Yeah, but what he lacks in angler of the year titles, he makes up for in wins. So you could have a guy with more angler of the year titles, like an Aaron. And but then he's got Denny over 20 has, classic appearances too. And clat, yep. Okay. So the top five are Denny. Top five, Denny, Larry Nixon at four, Rick Clon at three. And again, that, that boils down to my having a different opinion on the value of a classic win versus an AOI title. Because Rick has one AOI title on the BASS side, mm -hmm. but of course he's got four classic wins. If you flip that and, and you make the classic win worth more, you you throw the list into a little bit of a, a fair amount of change. A fair amount of change. Yeah. So the, the number two has to be Roland. Number two is Roland Martin. And Roland makes the big jump in terms of, of overall value relative to uh, Van Dam's number. Roland has accomplished 85% of what Kevin Van Dam has accomplished. He doesn't have, he's got basically the same number of classic appearances, uh, but Kevin's got four classic wins. Um, Roland has nine AOIs. Kevin has seven. Narrowly missed two others. As a matter of fact, if it weren't for some bizarre misstep, he'd, he'd certainly have eight. Uh, and, and of course, Kevin's got, Wait, more wins and are you talking about the aoi postseason deal or no what? no kevin kevin caught massive breaks with the aoi postseason situation oh I really, so that's... yeah i was really talking about 2006 you know we mentioned early in the show that kevin and alton jones and oh, Randy he Powell, got pq'd and then he went on and had like the craziest year ever but got a zero like he didn't even fish it and still almost won angler of the year if he finished third in angler of the year in 2006 but if he catches one fish at santee cooper one fish he wins AOI. Okay. So, so that's, that's the top 10 by the most objective standard I can come up with. Read it down from one, one through 20, just names. Okay. Just to have it, have it on record based on your, <laughs> this is a snapshot in time. Now another tournament happens and this list gets, moved just slightly and usually only toward the the lower listed guys but number one kevin van dam number two roland martin number three rick clon number four larry nixon number five denny brower number six aaron martins number seven gary klein number eight mark davis number nine david dudley number 10 jay ellis number 11 edwin evers number 12 clark wenlet number 13 greg hackney Number 14, Davey Height. Number 15, Bill Dance. Number 16, 
Andy Morgan. Number 17, Skeet Reese. Number 18, Guido Hibden. Number 19, Brian Thrift. Number 20, Jacob Wheeler. Wow. And if you want the next three, just because they're or next few, just because they're interesting names. Mm -hmm. 21 is Hank Parker. 22 is Mike Iconelli. 23 is Gerald Swindle. That was my question. I had written Ike down. Yeah. And Gerald Swindle makes the list with two Angler of the Years and one Bassmaster Open win. And a lot of over 20 classic appearances. That's what I'm saying. That's a, that's how impressive and how consistent you have to be. To, that's what I'm saying. I'm not I'm looking at it like, oh, I, they haven't won. I'm looking at it like, man, do you know how hard it is? Like to be at the top, to be number two without a Bassmaster Classic or a FLW championship win, Roland Martin had to have nine angler of the years. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's absolutely what it took. And, and you know, people can quibble with the list, and I'm sure they will. So where's like a Connell sit? Is he <laughs> on that list? Oh, he's on the list. Uh, I'm going to have to go way down for Dustin Because, Connell. I mean, he's like just winning tournaments and winning Red Crests and all sorts of stuff. Uh, Dustin Cannell ranks 53rd. Right? Okay, what about like a, a Brent Ayler? Brent like I'm, th Ayler. I'm thinking about just super consistent guys who everyone's like, yeah, he's really good. Like, is he on the list? Uh, of course. You remember if you've if you've won a major championship, With all the, yep. AOI, yeah. Uh, Brent Ayler, 46. He's between Paul Elias and Justin Lucas. Okay, so here's my next question. Where's Boyd sit on this list of Boyd the greatest Aglers of all time? Well, remember, this list is designed to give us the GOAT. If we wanted to get down oh, into... Major say, champ, classic champ, open right. champ. This is not designed to uh, consider everybody who's ever yeah, yeah, fished yeah. something like this because um, Boyd ranks 82nd on this list. Yeah, but no, remember, there are only 115 guys on this list. And, and the 115th guy is, is Kevin Hawk. And with all due respect to Kevin Hawk, there's no way Kevin is the 115th greatest angler of all time. He ranks well below that. Mm -hmm. But he met the criteria to be considered. No, I understand. I get it. Um, I don't think anyone's going to gonna argue with that. Now, here, here's one for you personally, Matt. For you personally. Uh, the highest ranking angler, not already in the Bass Fishing Hall of Fame, is David Dudley. But he's not yet 50 years old. So he's not eligible until mm -hmm. 2025. But the highest ranking angler who will be eligible for next year is Edwin Evers. He's 11th all time. And and he, and Clark Wenlet is 12th all time. He should be in. Hackney, 13th all time. Mm -hmm. He should be in. Andy Morgan is eligible. 16th all time. Um. And These are Skeet guys who you might want to. Yeah, Skeet got in and so well deservedly. Skeet's an all timer. Is uh, yeah, that's a good question. Is Blockett on that list? Uh wow. Let's see. Is Blockett on the list? He's Blockett had to have qualified for classics. a ton of championships, hasn't he? And classics, tons of classics. He has made it to quite a few. Let's see if he's in here. Let's see how many classics. He's been in eight classics. Eight classics. I know he made some wood cups. That's what I'm checking now. Eight classics is impressive, folks. Eight classics is very impressive. And he's no made nine that. forest wood cups. So he has 17 title appearances. Let's see. Let me figure he, out. His he's score. approaching as many uh, live cell phone YouTube videos a day as he is classic appearances. <laughs> I'm gonna uh, I'm going blind searching for Blockett here, but he's he's on here somewhere. It's just a a very very oh it's 115 people. Uh, yeah. Other ones that people want to know: yeah. Polinick, Randall Tharp, any of those? Yeah, I saw Polinick. He's Polinick is probably higher than people might realize. He's got a lot of classic appearances. He's got a couple of AOIs. He ranks 25th all time. That ain't bad. Jordan Lee, 27th all time. Mm -hmm. Those are young. Like, so what you have to remember is with what Jordan and Jacob have accomplished, we're not talking about anglers who have the most upside or who are the hottest right now. It is all time since the beginning of somewhat reasonable statistics were kept 
and records were kept on this. So the fact that you've got a, a Jacob Wheeler, a Jordan Lee that are as high as they are, a Polinick that are as high as they are right now on that list, give them another 10, 20, 30 years at this because KVD did it for three and a half decades. And then you'll start to see it be statistically a, a little bit level comparing it. Yeah. Anytime you take a snapshot of a sport, you are on some level doing a disservice to the guys who are in the middle of their careers. Mm -hmm. Where does Ott rank? Because Ott was in the top 15 of Tim Horton's list of all time. And while I love Ott and consider him a very talented angler, the fact that he cracked the top 15 on that list, I didn't think was anywhere near accurate. I love Ott Defoe. He ranks 30th yep. right now. Oh, that's that's shockingly high. It's really good. You know, he's got the classic. Obviously, that's his biggest uh, point gatherer mm -hmm. at the moment. Um, and, and he scores, he comes in at 25.5% of what Van Dam's score is. I think that, uh, I think that's an interesting way to kind of evaluate these guys is on the percentage of, of where they fall relative to Van Dam. It's fascinating stuff, Ken. It really is like it, it's, it's tedious, but fun to put together mm -hmm. because now I'm not saying, I'm not saying this system is the best for ranking the goat, but, uh, if you, if you think you have a better system, you're going to, you're going to have to convince me. <laughs> Does Bass After Dark have an actual like website where it lives? No, not right now. We don't. Um, I would love just... for you to keep, I would, you need somewhere where that list is and then you can just. I would love to see, here's what, oh, there's just not enough people who care to make money at this, but I would love to <laughs> have a money. website where you could go in and you could apply the values that you find valuable and be like, okay, who is the greatest from 98 to 2008 based on top tens? And then you apply those and then boom, there's your list. And then you can make your own list based on, I, I'm just saying, I know that that's a pipe dream, but that would be awesome to have one of those where you have all the anglers with our stats input. You can change the values based on whatever you want. You want to take, you want to do just wins. You want to do just classics. You want to do top 10 finishes. You want to add more the equal values for cups and classics to where you can mix and match your own list. Yeah, that would be cool. And of course, I can do that with my list because yeah. I have access to it all. And I, I have monkeyed with it. Uh, I can tell you the valuations I that that I put on it to share with everybody today are not the same valuations I started with. Um, I've tried to fine tune them a little bit, and I tried to go as deep as I could. You know, oh, let me get let me get uh, all Americans in here too because that's uh, an accomplishment. Let me get U.S. Opens in here too, yeah. but I only counted wins for that. Mm -hmm. not appearances. Yeah, that's fair. And, and you know, if somebody, point, you have to. Yeah, if somebody wants to tell me my system is not fair, I'm going to shrug my shoulders and say, you may be right, but have at it, have at it, you know, knock yourself out and, uh, and, and tell me why I'm wrong. Uh, don't just tell me I'm wrong. That's easy. Um, tell me where I'm wrong and why I'm wrong. And then, and then maybe you'll, you'll get me to buy in with you. I, I'm highly impressed. <laughs> final final words on this, and we'll take a final break, and then we'll come back and put some finishing touches on the... Uh, th this show is going to get a lot of views because I can literally, legitimately clickbait title this one, which I never there you do. Go. We talked about a controversy at fishing locks and then who the greatest of all time is. What more does anybody want? I guess my big takeaway on this is not that Kevin Van Dam is, is demonstrably, I think, the greatest competitive bass angler of all time. It's just how far ahead of everyone else he is. Um, by my system of scoring, only the top four anglers of all time have even accomplished half as much as he has. How about that? It's insane. And we also forget the fact that he's young. Like Kevin's young. 
when he retired. He retired. What 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 is the average age of retirement or that guys who quit on their own quit? Like, I know you do all that. But do you have that? Like, I mean, like, didn't Denny fish into his 60s? Yeah, Denny fished and won and, and, and did remarkably well into his 60s. Larry Nixon into his 70s. Rick Clun into his 70s. into his 70s. Yeah. Roland Martin into his 60s. 50s Unfortunately, 60s. yeah. Unfortunately, for most of these guys, and, and this is to balance out the Kevin factor there. Yeah, Kevin retired pretty early. I mean, Kevin is is going to be 57 later this year. I mean, uh, and quite frankly, he accomplished most of this before 53. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He, he absolutely did. He accomplished most of this before 45. <laughs> and, and that's true of everybody. That's true of all these guys. Most of these guys accomplished their their point gathering before age 45. So what makes a guy like Denny Brower or Roland Martin impressive is those guys racked up top 10 AOI finishes and tournament wins mm -hmm. after the age of 55 and 60. Um, but to, did Kevin lose much in terms of, of the scoring system by retiring at 56? No, he did not. Kevin was unlikely to add significantly to his points totals by continuing even well, if he won an event or two um it was unlikely that he was gonna really rack him up until he does his tv show for a couple of years and then gets bored and then decides he wants to use a legend exceptions to come back to bass and then he wins the angler of the year because now he's had four <laughs> years of experience on forward facing sonar he goes into the classic because he's tied with rick clun and he really wants number five he gets number five he holds it over his head and then he actually retires for good on stage yeah until that happens anything else ken that was fun Bass After Dark this Thursday, 8 p.m. Central Time, 9 Eastern. Log in. Check out BTC, Brian the Carpenter, Ken Duke, and a panel of three mystery guests. Also, check out the big Bass podcast. Two separate channels, two different shows. Uh, you're a busy, busy man uh, who's created quite a, a, uh, quite a unique little niche in this world of... Uh, bass fishing talk shows in a day and age where it's hard to to carve a niche I, well i hope that's a compliment because i'm having a lot of fun doing definitely it definitely a compliment working with brian and terry and nathan is a, is a really good time and and uh, we're trying to be a little different tell the stories that otherwise don't get told and um uh this this week on uh, bass after dark our question is going to be should there be tournaments during the spawn we're going to talk to some top biologists about that fantastic all right i'm gonna let you go thanks matt always have a thanks, blast man. here appreciate you same here that was awesome all right that is the one and only ken duke there we go and uh big shout out to him like i said that was like six plus months of uh in the works there and then i just wanted to wait till the right time came up and then Wheeler went in back to back and then say, actually what started it, which we didn't even get into was I was talking about eight consecutive top tens in a row for Jacob Wheeler. And I called Ken to say, has anyone ever done more than eight consecutive top tens at the top? And he goes, check Roland Martin. Well, I checked Skeet and Kevin and Rick and Larry and all these guys. And I didn't check Roland. And I look at Roland and at one point in time, I think it was late sixties, early seventies, Roland Martin went third consecutive top 10 finishes in a row so wheeler i do we call it rolling watch now we'll have ken back on if it even gets remotely close to this with top 10 finishes but i included uh classics in that because wheeler's eight in a row including a red crest with regular season events he's fishing against 80 79 in this past one if you've been paying attention to the world of professional bass fishing anglers and the bpt and roland was fishing against a myriad of different field sizes uh in the past if uh, i think i got all that right if ken had harry he'd probably be pulling it out here and me try to talk statistically about what was going on but uh we're gonna take our final break of the show when we come back talk about what we have going on the rest of the week uh and there's another Elite Series tournament that kicks off in two days on the St. John's River. So a lot going on in the world of professional bass fishing. It's BTL on a Tuesday. We'll be back right after this. In 2023, we became a household name in the crappie fishing world thanks to Power Breaks the Game Changer. Hey, bass fishing world, buckle up. 
because <laughs> you're next. It's going to be fun. Welcome to the next evolution of our product line, Power Brake Sidekick, designed to install right on your shallow water anchors. We are the first and only fishing brake company to offer a breakaway system. Just like with the Game Changer, the Power Brake Sidekick has it as well. And it's not a matter of if you're going to need it, it's when. Power Brakes, the most durable fishing brakes available on the market today. Made right here in the USA with our rock solid two year warranty. Hey, not all fishing brakes are built equally, and you owe it to yourself to find out why ours are different. Power Brake Sidekick, order yours today at mypowerbrakes.com. You'll be glad you did. Yes. Fishing isn't just a hobby, it's an obsession. Whether it's blazing hot or bitterly cold, bright sunshine, raining, or even snowing, someplace, somewhere, there's a fish that's ready to bite. And as the angler, you need baits that will catch the fish anywhere, anytime, no matter the conditions. From throwing top waters to cranking the depths, know the baits to throw. Choose Spro. Having confidence in your tackle while on the water is one of the main things to success, in my opinion. In the last couple of years with Denali, I've had just that from anything from spinning rods, casting rods, tungsten products, even now to casting and spinning reels. I have the confidence to go out there and get the job done and know that all my equipment is gonna handle it and do it just the way I want it. The thing about Denali is you've got great quality products at a great price point, so make sure you check them out. Your early morning mentality is your every hour mentality. All gas, no brakes, focus. Purpose. Power. Destined for the water, but confident everywhere else. A calming buzz before the storm, the truth of nature itself. You can't catch lightning in a bottle. There's a limit out there, but it's not with your gear. Unrelenting power delivery. Unparalleled weight savings. Keeping you on the water, whether you run a 9-9 or out scoping your best fun. In this rare air, there's power in the silence. It's a mindset, thinking only of the things that matter and freeing your mind from the things that you trust. Get the best patterns back by tournament data. Start by finding the best 10% of your lake. Know exactly what to look for and what to throw. After that, you just put them in the boat. Try the Deep Dive app today. Look at that beast right there. All right, welcome back. Wrapping things up here on a Tuesday. Uh, as soon as I'm done with this, I'm going to jump on with Andrew and Todd for the open pros pick them for the St. John's River. I'm supposed to do that in like five minutes, so for those... We were wondering about that. Guys, the uh, angler of the year through the first three tournaments is the likes of which we have never seen before on the Elite Series as we approach almost 40% way through. So just in the top 25, you have Logan Parks in 24th, Ben Milliken in 23rd, Wesley Gore in 20th, uh, John Garrett in 14th, Kyle Patrick in sixth, JT Tompkins in fifth, Tyler Williams in second, and Trey McKinney in first. So eight out of the nine rookies that came through the Opens last year are in the top 25 in the Angler of the Year standings, which is wild. Which is wild. So look at the first eight that are out of the classic right now. So let's just say they do 30. Uh, let's just say they do 39 for the classic this year. So there's eight guys that are taking spots. We're going to do 40th through 47. These are guys that would be in the classic after the first three. Had the guys that weren't even on the radar at this time last year not made the Bassmaster Elite Series. This is going to blow your mind. Brock Mosley. Taku Itu, 
Drew Cook, John Cox, Justin Atkins, Greg Hackney, Jason Christie, and Lee Livesey. So those are all the guys that right now, as it stands after three, would have been in the Classic, but aren't right now through the points because damn near every single rookie is absolutely smoking it. And Jordan Lee came back. So three tournaments in, three anglers who weren't even on the Elite Series last year with Jordan Lee coming over from MLF, with Trey McKinley, Trey McKinney, Tyler Williams, and Jordan Lee uh, are one, two, three. And then don't look now. This is way too early. But Justin Hamner is in fourth. The guy won the 2024 Bassmaster Classic. He's in fourth in the Angler of the Year point standings. We we'll also have an opportunity here for a Classic and an Angler of the Year in the same all right big shout out to ken duke like i said that was a show that was a long time in the making uh well worth listening to i'll probably re-listen i never re-listen to btls unless i get a lot of comments that i just did an awful job at it and then i listen back to it to try to critique but uh i'll listen back to it just to try to put things into perspective but let me know what you guys think ken get it right Kevin, Roland, Rick Clun, Larry Nixon, Denny Brower, and Jacob Wheeler down in 20th. As of right now, that includes his past win. Did he get it right? Did he get it wrong? Is there a better way to measure this? Tomorrow, Daryl Gleason, I mentioned it before, the Ocean Ponies. Dude went and witnessed a practice round at Augusta for the Masters. I called him. I started asking, what are the similarities? How do these guys prepare? Is there anything? And I was like, well, hell, just come on the show and talk about it. So Daryl Gleason tomorrow talking about the similarities in practice between, you know, the professional golf guys. I mean, he could have reached out and grabbed Tiger Woods on one of the practice days. That's how close I think he was to him. So he's going to talk about the uh, the combos on that. And then Thursday, uh, we'll give away another color number seven uh, for day four with Frank Scalish. That's all we got. Check out Open Pros Pick em. Should be up here in a couple hours. I got two minutes to get over and record that. So thanks, Ken. Thanks to all the viewers, listeners, and feedback. We'll talk to everybody tomorrow. Later.